The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this morning, Audit Scotland released a damning report on the state of Scotland's NHS. Amongst many shocking figures, people waiting over a year for treatment has jumped from 3,500 to 40,000. That's an 11-fold increase since 2019, despite patient numbers falling. When he was Health Secretary, Hamza Youssef brought in his NHS recovery plan that was supposed to bring waiting times down. So why, First Minister, are things getting worse, not better? First Minister. <clears throat> Presiding officer, uh, first and foremost, let me say that we take very seriously uh, the comments and the report by the Auditor General that were published uh, this morning. There's simply no doubt or indeed attempts by us to downplay the seriousness of the challenges the health service is facing as it recovers uh, from what is undoubtedly the biggest shock of its 75-year existence, the global pandemic. And of course, there are challenges for every single health service right across the UK. To answer uh, Douglas Ross's question directly, uh, we are still facing the accumulative impacts of the pandemic. Uh, people are still, for example, winter suffering from, the, from COVID. That has an impact not just, uh, of course, on IPC within hospitals, uh, but also, of course, on staff who are able to perform elective care uh, and treatments and surgeries. These are common challenges. I accept, of course, they are, are my responsibility here in NHS uh, Scotland, as well as the health secretaries. These are common challenges right across the country. In fact, if I look at some of the latest data in September last year, it did show that Scotland, there was 123 patients waiting per 1,000 of the population for the treatment time guarantee and new outpatient appointments. That is fewer than in England, where it's 137 per thousand on the referral to treatment waiting list. And in Wales, that figure is 245 per thousand. So my point in making that is that, of course, there are challenges uh, that Scotland's NHS is facing. Of that, there is no doubt. Uh, these are common challenges right across the UK. And what we'll do is make sure we fund the NHS. And that's why I'm pleased that in the budget announced by the Deputy First Minister last year, that we invested a record £19.5 in our health service. Douglas Ross. This is an Audit Scotland report into NHS Scotland. Please, First Minister, focus on our NHS here in Scotland. Because that shocking 11-fold increase in people waiting over a year is, of course, against a target which should be zero. There was a target for March 2023 for people waiting over a year to be eradicated. Instead, it is now over 40,000. And Audit Scotland say that the latest SNP targets to reduce waiting times are unlikely to be met. Those are Hamza Yusuf's targets. It was his recovery plan. When he was Health Secretary, he said, this plan will drive the recovery of our NHS, not just to pre-pandemic level, but beyond. Yet another example of Hamza Yusuf winging it. That arrogant claim now rings hollow and patients in Scotland are suffering. Hamza Yusuf sent waiting times in the wrong direction. Will he now finally admit his plan has failed? First Minister. Sorry, officer, uh, here is what we have managed to achieve and I accept of course there's still the way to go and I accept of course the recommendations of the Audit Scotland report. But we have seen, because of the investment that we've made in national treatment centres, an additional 20,000 procedures through the investment in our national treatment centres. That's why we've seen also an increase in the last 12 months, an 11% increase in performed operation over the last year. It's why outpatients waiting longer than two years has fallen by almost 70%. Inpatient day case uh, patients waiting the longest fallen by over 25%. And that is why we're investing over £19.5 billion, a record amount, in our national health service. What makes that recovery, of course, more difficult is a 10% cut to our capital budget, yeah. which means we have less to spend on yeah. capital health infrastructure. What makes that job more difficult, presiding officer, is only being provided £10.8 million of health consequentials in the UK government's autumn statement, enough for five hours of NHS activity. So while the Conservatives rightly will ask questions about what further we can do, let me say that this SNP government will invest in our NHS, unlike Douglas Ross's party, who are cutting the funding to the bones. Douglas Ross. 
It is not just the Conservatives that are asking these questions, it is Audit Scotland and, crucially, it is our constituents who are suffering. But, as usual, Hamza Youssef promised the world and delivered very little. Just like the ferries he claimed he would build, just like the Hate Crime Act that he said would be a success, just like the trains that he promised to get to run on time. Audit Scotland say they can't even fully measure how badly his recovery plan has failed because the SNP has not been transparent with the public. This is what they say. Updates against a range of the ambitions are absent. Hamza Youssef is covering up just how bad it's been. But the reason for this failure is clear from the report. Audit Scotland states there is no overall vision for Scotland's NHS. No overall vision. How can Hamza Youssef and this SNP government have no vision for Scotland's NHS? First Minister. Presiding officer, again, we will respond to the Audit Scotland report in due course. But let me say to Douglas Ross, let me say to Douglas Ross that when it comes to the SNP stewardship of our NHS, that stewardship, of course, has seen record investment in our NHS of over £19.5 billion. It has seen resource funding more than double, Members. increased by over 100 per cent since we have been in power. It has shown record staffing in our NHS of over 31,300 whole-time equivalents. There's more nurses in Scotland per head than in England. We have the best NHS staff anywhere in the UK. We have the best performing A&E departments, not for one year, not for five years, but for eight consecutive years, presiding officer. And because we value our NHS staff, we are the only nation in the UK not to have NHS staff go on strike, presiding officer. When it comes to the challenges that our NHS is facing, undoubtedly facing. I'm not downplaying them. This government is making sure that we invest in that recovery. But the difference between the Tories and the SNP presiding officer is that we will invest in our NHS while the Conservatives are cutting it right down to the bone. Yeah. Douglas Ross. There is no vision for Scotland's NHS. Not my words, but the words of the Auditor General for Scotland. And they make it very clear that the lack of vision has not just happened because of the pandemic and the issues that our NHS faced. There has not been a, a vision for Scotland's NHS since 2013. They say, and I quote, there has been no unified vision for the future direction of the entire healthcare system published since 2013. 2013. Hamza Youssef has no vision for Scotland's NHS. He's been asleep at the wheel like every other SNP First Minister. There's been a lost decade of leadership in Scotland's NHS. Ten years of stalling and delay has had dire consequences for patients. How long are people in Scotland going to have to wait for the SNP to get their act together? First Minister. Officer are investing in that recovery now. That's why, for example, those outpatients waiting the longest has reduced by se almost 70%. That's why inpatients waiting the longest have reduced by over 25%. It's Mr. why Ross. operations performed in the last 12 months have increased by 11%. It's why, through our investment, we've created additional capacity for 20,000 procedures. It's why we're investing a record £19.5 in our NHS, despite the fact that the UK government, in their autumn statement, provided Let's a less hear than the first £11 minister. million pounds for NHS health consequentials. That's enough to fund five hours of NHS activity, presiding officer. So I will take not a single lecture from Douglas Ross about investing in our NHS when his party is responsible for a 10% capital cut in our budget, which is deeply impacting our health infrastructure. Douglas Ross, presiding officer, Douglas Ross, presiding officer, I'm afraid, is presiding over a party that has taken a hatchet to our public services. So while they cut it to the bone, we'll continue to invest in the most precious institution in this country, yeah. our National Health Service. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, we are in the middle of a cost of living crisis where too many people are struggling to make ends meet. At the same time, oil and gas giants are making record profits. British Gas, a tenfold increase in profits in one year 
to over £700 million. BP, £11 billion profit. Total, £16 billion profit. Shell, £22 billion profit. Why does the First Minister think that these companies can't afford to pay more tax? First Minister. Planning officer, I have to say, um, a week after the P&J put Anna Sawar's face on the front page with his Labour colleagues and called him a traitor of the North East, it is incredibly brave of Anna Sawar to come up here and say that he is standing up for Let's the North hear the East. First Minister. I, of course, travelled to the North East this week and heard the palpable anger from oil and gas and renewable energy yeah. sectors and industries, who of course down. spoke about Anna Sawar's plans, the Labour Party's plans, which would, in their words, not my words, in the industry's words, risk up to 100,000 jobs in the North East. How does Anna Sawar think, in the midst of a cost of living crisis, throwing 100,000 workers in the scrap heap? is going to help households up and down the country. So we absolutely believe in a windfall tax on energy companies. What we don't believe in is Anna Members, let and us Labour's hear the First Minister. plans to raid the North East so they can build new nuclear power plants in England. So we won't allow it. We won't stand for it. We'll stand up for the North East. Anna Sauer can't even stand up to Keir Starmer, presiding officer. Thank you, thank you. Let's every, hear Mr. Sarwar. Every time Labour's proposed a change to help working people, warnings have been made and they've not come true. In 1997, when Labour proposed a minimum wage and a windfall tax, they were warned it would cost two million jobs. It didn't happen. It improved the lives of working people across the country. Now, Hamza Yusuf used to support Labour's windfall tax, but now he's siding with energy giants, making record profits, while today he is putting up tax for working people across this country who are struggling. Maybe Let's members hear Mr. Listen. Sarwar. While Shell have brought in £22 billion in profit, energy bills have increased by 60% and people are struggling to heat their homes. While BP make £11 billion in profit, Food prices are up 25% and people are struggling to put food on the table. While British Gas sees a tenfold increase in profits, mortgages have increased by £2,000 a year and families risk losing their home. Why does the SNP believe that if you earn £28,500, you have the broadest shoulders and should pay more tax, but if you're an energy giant making billions in profit, you should pay less tax? First Minister. Presiding uh, Officer, imagine taking a lecture about standing up for those in the lowest incomes from the man who's flip flopped his yeah. position and now believes in lifting the cap on bankers' yeah. bonuses, yeah, Presiding absolutely. Officer. Oh, wow. Who would have thought? Who would have thought the party of the few, not the party yeah, of yeah, the many, yeah, Presiding yeah, Officer? Yeah, yeah. And it is astonishing that Anna Sawa has stood up in this chamber and called the energy industry liars. Yep. That is what he has done. Yep. Let me just say what Offshore Energy UK have said. They claim that Labour's proposals would lose at least up to 42,000 jobs, and I quote, wipe out North Sea investment. Investment bank Stifle have said that under a worst case scenario, Labour's proposals would wipe up to 100,000 jobs out, put them on the scrap heap. So what you get with Labour's energy proposal, presiding officer, is the worst of both worlds. Yeah. You end up getting all of the investment in oil and gas, which of course has been good for Scotland over the decades. That gets completely wiped out. And then what does Keir Starmer do? He dumps his £28 yeah. billion pound a year yeah. green prosperity fund. Yeah. Scotland, Scotland's energy should be in Scotland's hands because successive Westminster governments have raided the North East, yeah. have raided Aberdeen, yeah. have raided our oil and gas revenues, yeah. and not a single penny has been invested back into the people of Aberdeen or the North East. And for that, Anna Sauer should stand up and apologise. Yeah.
Anna Sarwar. Presiding officer, presiding officer, I can't wait to present the choice at the next general election between the SNP and the Let Labour Party. Let us hear. I can't sorry, wait. Mr. Mr. Sarwar. Sorry. Let's ensure that we can hear one another, Mr. Sarwar. I was just saying, presiding officer, I can't wait to present the choice to the Scottish people come to the next general election because firmly the SNP on the side of energy giants making billions and Labour trying to bring down people's bills and on the side of working people. But let's be clear, but let's be clear what Labour's windfall tax on record profits of energy giants will be spent on. It will mean more jobs, lower bills, greater energy security and delivering a just transition for Scotland. It will mean investment in GB Let Energy, us hear, Mr. a publicly-owned gener energy generation company headquartered here in Scotland. It will mean investment in our ports, in onshore wind, offshore wind, green hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and strengthening our supply chains. It will mean creating 50,000 new jobs in Scotland. So isn't it the case that the Scottish people have a choice? The SNP increasing tax on working people while siding with the oil and gas giants or Labour creating jobs, bringing down bills and firmly on the side of working people. First Minister. Presiding <laughs> Officer, first can I, can I remind Anna Sarwar when he talks about people in the midst of a cost of living crisis, he now has flip-flopped his way to being in a position where he believes on retaining the cap on the child benefits, yeah. but wants to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses, yeah. presiding yeah. officer. It is utterly outrageous. And let me say to Anna Sawara, when I was in Aberdeen earlier this week, I can't wait to go head to head with Anna Sawar uh, in Aberdeen yeah. Yeah, 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 on the yeah. general election. Yeah. And in fact, he can debate yeah. the oil and gas industry and renewables Members. With me in Aberdeen any and every single day of the week. And Anna Sawar claims that the Labour and incoming Labour government will make all sorts of First investments. First Minister, if you just give oh, me a moment. Oh, they don't like it, Presiding Officer. They First don't like Minister. it one single bit. First Minister, just give me a moment. Let's ensure we carry on our proceedings with courtesy and respect. Let's ensure we can hear one another. And Anna Sawar claims that there'll be a whole range and raft of investment from an incoming Labour government. Of course, what is obvious, presiding officer, is the branch manager didn't get the memo yeah. that the £28 billion yeah. has been dumped. Yeah. So not a single penny of that investment yeah. is going to be to coming either. to Scotland. Yeah. So, presiding yeah. officer, successive UK governments have, have taken £400 billion in today's prices and oil and gas revenue raided the North Sea as a cash cow without investing a fraction of it back in the North East yeah. and back in Aberdeen. With Anna Sawar's plans, you end up with 100,000 workers on the scrap heap and no investment in our net zero yeah. ambitions. Isn't it about time that Scotland's energy was in Scotland's hands, Presiding Officer? Question wow. number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the first... Sorry. We cannot hear Ms Chapman. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether successive changes to national taxation policy in Scottish budgets will support the redistribution of wealth and help sustain vital public services. First Minister. Well, in short, yes, our changes to income tax in Scotland has made it more progressive. This approach means that we have an additional £1.5 billion to invest in 2024 25 uh, from income tax compared to if we'd matched UK government policy, something Douglas Ross, of course, advocated at the time. That £1.5 billion being invested in public services to try and offset the huge impact on the availability of public spending by Westminster austerity. With further powers such as those uh, needed to tax wealth effectively, we could do so much more to build on our progressive tax system and, of course, further protect public services here in Scotland. Maggie Chapman. I thank the First Minister for that answer. We all have too many constituents struggling with grinding poverty for whom public services are a lifeline. I am proud that tax changes, which the Scottish Greens have championed, mean that that one and a half billion pounds more is available for those services. Tax changes, which mean the better off pay more and the people on lower incomes pay less. Those promising tax cuts must be honest about what services they would cut. 
The STUC has argued, and the First Minister has just recognised, that Scotland can and should do more to use tax powers to redistribute wealth and make the case that taxation is a public good. Can I ask the First Minister how he plans to build that consensus for progressive taxation as a force for good? First Minister. Well, the Government is absolutely committed, as I've said, to progressive taxation. I thank the STUC and others for the contribution that they've made, of course, and the uh, Deputy First Minister engaged with a number of stakeholders in relation to our progressive taxation plans. And we'll continue to have that engagement with stakeholders, and of course, that includes the business community uh, and, and, of course, the people of Scotland around our progressive taxation plans. And poll after poll tells us that the public support, public service investment is backed by progressive taxation. So when Douglas Ross stood up in this chamber and urged the Scottish Government to follow the disastrous Liz Truss budget, he needs to have the humility to say how wrong he was. And when Anna Sawar says that he will cut taxes for the highest earners, he needs to be honest about what public services will he cut. His tax plans in the round, presiding officer, will reduce revenue by £561 million. Will that mean he'll scrap the Scottish child payment? Will it mean he'll scrap free prescriptions? Will it mean he'll scrap free bus travel? Or, as his finance spokesperson hinted just this week, that will they end up scrapping free university education? So, presiding officer, we'll continue our commitment to progressive taxation, our commitment to the social contract in Scotland, which provides tuition fees, uh, provides that there's no tuition fees for higher education, provides widespread access to bus services, free prescriptions and a host of other benefits and of course we will seek common cause with others like the STUC who believe in progressive taxation. Colin Beattie. The SNP Scottish Government's progressive tax plans help to deliver a strong social contract ensuring additional targeted funding to protect people and our vital public services. Meanwhile, Scottish Labour's priorities appear to be elsewhere, seeming to indicate last weekend that they now support cutting income tax. Can the First Minister provide any update regarding what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impact which this could have on Scotland's public finances and the Scottish Government's ability to fund public services? First Minister. Well, we know uh, that uh, from the Conservatives, if we'd follow their budget proposals, of course, we'd have £1.5 billion less to spend. We know yeah. from Anna Sauer's tax policies in the round that we think there would be about £561 million less to spend and invest in our NHS, yeah. in our education, yeah, yeah. in our justice services, in social uh, security. And, of course, uh, Anna Sauer has made the point that those earning, for example, 30000 pay more here in Scotland, they pay... 94 pence a month more, and for that, of course, get free university education, get the most generous childcare offer uh, anywhere Best in the UK, uh, end up, of course, not paying a single penny yeah. for their medicines, ensure that they get free personal and nursing care, and a whole range of other benefits. And that's why poll after poll shows that the public are supportive of progressive taxation if it is used, as we are doing, to invest in our public services. So, if Labour want to continue to give people like Anna Sauer a huge tax cut, which will end up, of course, reducing the revenue we have to spend on public services. He has to have the honesty to say what public services he'll be cutting. Question number four, Fergus Ewing. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister regarding the delivery of the Scottish Government's recently published depopulation action plan, what will be different about this approach, which is described as local by default, national by agreement, particularly towards the approval of new developments supported by local communities. First Minister. The Addressing Depopulation Action Plan does set out the Scottish Government's strategic approach aimed at supporting local communities that are facing population decline. And I know it's an issue that the member has a significant interest in. And, of course, that is set against the very devastating impact that a hard Brexit is having on our rural and island communities. In terms of uh, what new the plan will do, it will deliver a whole new programme of work which will support and empower affected areas through funding, new research, enhanced partnership working with those local communities. And we do acknowledge, as Fergus Ewing has said, the importance of local leadership and that communities are best placed to respond to their own challenges. Fergus Ewing. So also, young people leaving Scotland for other countries forever, for their lifetime, has been Scotland's tragedy and our shame. Therefore, will he, where there is a chronic depopulation problem, now agree that economic developments 
which would bring major jobs and major community benefits, will henceforth be treated as developments of national economic significance. First Minister. Mr. President, officer, I'm more than happy to look at that proposal. Of course, when planning applications are called into the Scottish Government, the whole range of factors are considered. Of course, the natural environmental impact, but also the economic impact is, of course, important. I won't comment on any, of course, uh, specific uh, live uh, application. But Fergus Ewing is absolutely right. If we want to retain our young people, then we have to ensure that we create the economic opportunities. We have to ensure that we invest in the housing, which we're doing, uh, of course, through our affordable housing supply programme in our rural uh, communities, and we have to ensure that we invest in the connectivity, which, of course, we are also doing as well. But Fergus Ewing makes some very important points, but what is devastating our rural communities, undoubtedly, uh, is the hard uh, damage that has been called by, by a hard uh, Brexit foisted upon uh, uh, Scotland against its very will. Yeah. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Housing was mentioned 114 times in the Depopulation Action Plan. Yet homes for Scotland were not consulted on the plan, nor were they even aware of it, despite being advisers for housing to 2040. Does the First Minister accept this failure to, to properly consult the sector on this plan as a huge mis misstep? And what action will he take to rectify this? Yeah. First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, we engage regularly with stakeholders. If there has been an omission, of course, I'm more than happy to look at that, and I'll ask the appropriate minister uh, to do so. But I go back to the point I made to my response to Fergus Ewing. Uh, housing in rural communities is absolutely essential when it comes to retaining and indeed attracting people to rural and island uh, communities. And of course, we published our Rural and, I and Island Housing Action Plan, published in October of last year, and it sets out a whole wide range of action that we're taking to support rural and island population. That includes, of course, continued investment in affordable housing, and of course, 10% uh, of those, uh, those affordable houses being in rural and island communities. Uh, continued support from com to communities through our Rural and Island Housing Fund to bring forward housing where they wish to do so, up to £25 million, of course, from the affordable housing budget over the next five years to support housing for key workers and a whole range of other action, which I'm happy for the Housing Minister to write to Pam Goso to give her confidence that we take seriously the issue of housing in our rural and island communities. Question number five, Douglas Lumsden. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government still has a policy of a presumption against any new oil and gas licences. First Minister. President Officer, oil and gas continues to play an important part in Scotland's energy transition. Our focus is on meeting energy security needs reducing emissions in line with climate goals and ensuring that just transition for workforces as North Sea oil and gas resources inevitably decline. As part of this approach, our draft energy strategy and just transition plan consulted on a presumption against licensing of new exploration of oil and gas. We've never proposed a position of no new licensing at all. So unlike the Conservatives, we're not ignoring the scale of the climate crisis that is befalling our planet. We will work with the Mr. energy industry Sarwa. to accelerate that transition to net zero where we can. Yeah. <laughs> Douglas Lumsden. Yeah. <laughs> Presiding officer, the First Minister makes one trip up to Aberdeen and then masquerades as the saviour of the oil and gas industry. He must, he must think the people of the North East are buttoned up the back. Yeah. He's against Campbell, he's against Rosebank, and his government still has a presumption against any new oil and gas licences. So will the First Minister tell the Chamber today why he is in favour of importing more oil and gas, stopping new investment, which, as the First Minister knows, means throwing away thousands of livelihoods on the scrap heap? First Minister. Of course, if uh, Douglas Ross knew what he was talking about, he would know that the vast majority of oil that is extracted from the North Sea gets exported uh, overseas, presiding uh, officer. But what's clear to me, what's clear to the people of Scotland, what's clear to the people of the North East is that Westminster is not working for yeah. Scotland. For decades, the decades, presiding officer, the Conservatives have been telling the people of Scotland that Scotland's oil is running out. Now, all of a sudden, they're pretending that it's going to be lasting forever. Successive UK governments, let's hear Tory the First Minister, Labour, have used the North East as a cash cow, squandering £400 billion in today's prices 
of oil and gas revenue. So whether it's the Conservatives or Labour, whose policies, of course, could end up throwing 100,000 workers on the scrap heap, Westminster can't be trusted with Scotland's natural resources. It's high time, presiding officer, high time that Scotland's energy was in Scotland's hands so we can ensure cheaper bills, so we can ensure that we unleash the economic potential of the Green Revolution and, of course, that we can help to tackle the climate crisis, presiding officer. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. And I welcome the First Minister's uh, visit to Aberdeen this week and the engagement that he has had with the oil and gas sector. Can I ask uh, the First Minister if that engagement uh, with the oil and gas sector uh, will continue, uh, in particular regarding <laughs> retaining and increasing Let's the vital hear investment Mr. Stewart. needed to deliver a just transition? following the deeply concerning warnings that Labour's aggressive plans for the North Sea will put 100,000 jobs at risk, which is really serious for my constituents in Aberdeen, the North East and beyond. First Minister. Presiding officer, many of those in the North East of Scotland will have just seen the fact that Kevin Stewart is rightly standing up for his constituents, yeah. not using yeah. Scottish Government figures, but using industry figures that yeah. say that Labour's plans could risk up to 100,000 jobs. And we'll hear Labour laughing, yeah. laughing at Kevin Stewart, laughing at the people of Aberdeen, and laughing at our oil and gas workers, yeah. who, of course, have done an incredible job for Scotland over decades and continue to do an excellent job uh, for uh, Scotland. Let me say uh, this much. Let me reiterate what I've already said in previous exchanges presiding officer, is this, that we support in the SNP a windfall tax. Of that, there is no doubt. What we don't support is aggressive plans by Labour, not just to increase that windfall tax, but of course to raid the North East so they can pay for new nuclear power plants in England, presiding officer. That is unfair. That is not acceptable. So we believe in accelerating that transition to net zero. The oil and gas workers, who are incredibly skilled, who have incredible expertise, will be absolutely vital to that just transition. I can promise them, so long as the SNP is in government, we'll protect them from those damaging plans by Keir Starmer, by Labour, which would end up seeing them thrown on the scrap heap. Question number six, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the analysis by Citizens Advice Scotland suggesting that over 660,000 people are experiencing mental health problems due to increasing household debt. First Minister. The Scottish Government, of course, remains deeply concerned about the impact of the cost of living crisis, especially on those who are already struggling with poor mental health and also with money uh, worries as well. We know this is leading to far more people uh, seeking advice and support which is why we support free welfare debt and income maximisation advice services with funding of over £12.5 million allocated uh, this year. Mental health remains a priority and we have supported overall increases to mental health spend over the years. Through our 24-25 budget, the Scottish Government and NHS boards will continue to spend in excess of £1.3 billion for mental health. Uh, more widely, recognising the pressures on household budgets, since 2022-23, we continue to allocate around £3 billion a year to policies which tackle poverty and protect, as far as we possibly can, people during the ongoing cost of living crisis. Paul Sweeney. First Minister, people increasingly have nowhere to turn when their mental health deteriorates. Patients and some health boards are waiting over a thousand days to start psychological therapy, and one in four consultant psychiatry positions are vacant. And what is his government's response to cut £30 million more from the mental health budget, despite it already being £180 million adrift from the target? First Minister, when will your government start to take the crisis in mental health seriously and reverse the proposed cut to mental health funding in the budget? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, uh, let me just uh, correct Paul Sweeney on some issues in relation to our funding. We have a good track record on spending on mental uh, health. There have been, of course, that is in the face of 14 years of austerity under the SNP. Mental health spending by NHS Scotland has doubled in cash terms mm. from £651 million in 2006-07 to £1.3 in 2022, uh, up by almost 100 per cent. Expenditure on CAMS rose from £88 <coughs> million in 2020-2021 to £97.6 million in 2021 
2022. Of course, we've had challenges in the budget uh, that uh, we have uh, just announced, but we've ensured uh, that we are doing what we can to invest in uh, mental health. And what I would say uh, to Paul Sweeney, he was right to uh, reference the Citizens Advice Scotland uh, report uh, earlier. The cost of living crisis is undoubtedly a source of deep mental, uh, mental health uh, anguish for too many households up and down the country. So we'll continue to invest uh, in that. What is worrying, of course, is that Paul Sweeney's party, of course, uh, believes in retaining, for example, the two-child limit. Uh, the person who is likely to be the next Chancellor of the UK has promised, and I quote, to be tougher than the Tories on benefits. Through our actions, we have lifted last year an estimated 90,000 children out of poverty. So the Scottish Government will invest in helping people with debt, reducing the cost of living. But how much better would it be, presiding officer, if we didn't have to continue to mitigate the worst excesses and harm of Westminster, but instead took all the decisions about Scotland here in Scotland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Could the First Minister outline how increased funding for discretionary housing payments, for example, the impact on mental health issues in Scotland will actually help make up for the chronically insufficient UK housing benefits funding and how we in Scotland maximise support for low-income households here in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, Willie Coffey makes uh, an exceptionally important point. The damage done by the UK Government's three-year freeze to local housing allowance has been considerable. It's estimated uh, with an estimated £819 million pounds that have been lost. This, coupled, of course, with the cruel bedroom tax policy, is undoubtedly causing uh, great harm indeed. So while the Labour Party are failing to offer any change to these devastating policies, the Scottish Government will take action. We're investing an additional £6 million in discretionary housing payments, bringing the total to over £90 million to mitigate all of these cuts. This is helping over 90,000 low-income households pay their rent and keep their homes. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Jackson Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister join me in offering his congratulations to my constituent, Henry Wooga? Mm -hmm. Henry escaped the Nazi Holocaust, travelling from Nuremberg to Glasgow in 1939 at the age of 15. Here he met his wife Ingrid, also a survivor as a consequence of the kinder transport, an event celebrated in the film One Life, starring Sir Anthony Hopkins. Tomorrow, Henry turns 100 years of age. Uh, he's made a remarkable contribution to this country. I've tabled a motion supported by Paul O'Kane and Kirsten Oswald, MP, is tabling a similar motion in the House of Commons. Will he join me, and I hope the Chamber, in offering him many happy returns? <laughs> First Minister. I do. Uh, I wish uh, Henry would have a very happy 100th uh, birthday. Indeed, I've written to Henry uh, myself personally uh, in order to pass on my, my personal congratulations uh, to him. Jackson Carlaw is right. Uh, Henry Wuga is an absolute inspiration. It was just a number of weeks ago Jackson Carlaw and I and many, many members in this chamber were, of course, uh, commemorating Holocaust Memorial Day. And we heard very powerful testimony from a number uh, of those uh, who were either survivors or families of survivors of Holocaust and indeed other uh, genocides and the work that Henry personally has done over the decades in helping to, remember, to remind uh, and to inform people of the horrors of the Holocaust, which should never ever be forgotten by any of us, is truly an inspiration uh, for each and every single person in this country. So I want to pass on my congratulations, the best wishes, of course, uh, for uh, his birthday, but I want to put on record uh, my appreciation, the Scottish Government's appreciation, I think the whole country's appreciation for the incredible work that Henry Ruger has done, particularly in reminding us of the horrors of the Holocaust and saying uh, that we should never ever forget them, reflect on them, and of course work together to ensure that we see peace uh, right across the world, uh, wherever, that, uh, wherever we see violence, wherever we see discrimination, be it here at home or indeed abroad. Jackie Bailey. Scotland's NHS is directionless, risking patient safety and on the brink of breakdown. Not my words, presiding officer, that is Audit Scotland's assessment of the NHS under the SNP. In a devastating critique of the government, it points to a health service at breaking point with extreme overcrowding and long waiting times threatening patient safety. It accuses the SNP government of having no vision and calls for fundamental reform. The need for leadership is clear. 
but it is absent. Can I ask the First Minister, after 17 years of decline under the SNP, what reforms will he bring forward to save our NHS? First Minister. Of course we will uh, bring forward uh, reforms and the Health Secretary will detail that. We will work with staff to ensure to see what we can do, particularly in the preventative space, to see what more we can invest so individuals do not have to uh, go set, particularly to secondary care uh, and primary care, but particularly secondary care where we know there is intense pressure on our hospital sites right up and down uh, the country. But in 17 years, let me remind Jackie Bailey, of course, that we have record staffing in the NHS. We have record investment in the NHS. Yeah. We have the best paid staff in the NHS. And of course, we are the only country in the entire UK that has not lost a single day to strike action. But I think, and I stand to be corrected, but I think today there are junior doctor strikes in Labour-run NHS Wales presiding yeah, office. Yeah, so we'll yeah. continue yeah, yeah. to invest in our NHS. We'll continue to invest, most importantly, in the people who run the NHS, our, our nurses, our doctors, of course, all of the NHS, Agenda for Change staff, who do an incredible job, and we promise to continue to work with them for the best possible outcomes for patients across Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. First Minister, this coming Saturday it will be two years to the day that Russia launched an unprovoked, brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine. Putin's conflict still rages on. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers and civilians have been killed and maimed, with vast areas of Ukraine and many of its towns and cities devastated, with millions displaced. Scotland opened its doors and hearts to Ukrainian refugees, but the war also cost energy price rises and economic shocks. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the impact on households affected by poverty and the cost of living crisis of the ongoing war against Ukraine? And what message of solidarity will the First Minister send to the Ukrainian people, particularly the 26,000 who now call Scotland home? First Minister. I am very grateful to Kenneth Gibson for raising this remarkably important issue. I will be uh, joining others, I suspect, across this chamber on Saturday to commemorate uh, that uh, and reflect on the two-year illegal invasion by Russia uh, to, into Ukraine, of course, which we condemn in the strongest possible manner. We continue to be shocked. We continue to be appalled at the violence and the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding, continues to unfold in Ukraine, again, because of Russia's illegal actions. Scotland stands by uh, Ukraine. We stand for democracy. We stand for human rights. We stand for the rule of law at home and indeed abroad. So we offer our unqualified support for Ukrainian sovereignty and we wish a speedy U victory for Ukraine and a resolution which has to not just restore peace but ensure Ukrainian sovereignty, democracy, independence and territorial integrity. Since the war against Ukraine uh, began, over 26,600 people sponsored by an individual in Scotland uh, or the Scottish Government have arrived in the UK as of the 22nd of February uh, of uh, this year. I'm proud of how Scotland and the people of Scotland have responded to this humanitarian crisis. I'm grateful to all of those who have opened their homes and their hearts to displaced Ukrainians who are fleeing the war. And so long as those who have fled the war and come to Scotland, for as long as they want to call Scotland their home, they will always be given the warmest welcome possible. Yeah. Russell Finlay. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. The parents of Claire Ingalls have spent more than two years desperately trying to get answers. Ian and Fiona still don't know why her killer was in five separate bail orders, and they've now discovered that social workers tried to warn Claire about her violent new partner, but no one answered the door, and 72 hours later, she was killed. A council review failed to answer critical questions, and I'm not putting the First Minister on the spot. This isn't about party politics. This is about violence against women. But I would urge him to please look again at Ian and Fiona's request for a thorough and independent review. First Minister. Presiding Officer, I will genuinely look at that request again and see what further we can do in terms of any further independent review into this case. I can completely understand the deep sense of grief and anger that Ian and Fiona uh, are feeling. Uh, Russell Finley will know, of course, that I wrote to uh, the Lord President, the Lord Advocate, uh, on this issue, and I passed on those responses, I think, to Russell Finley uh, uh, earlier on. And, uh, of course, uh, many of these decisions that were taken at the time uh, would have been for the independent judiciary 
uh, to determine on in terms of the, failure, the, the, the questions and potential failures that uh, Ian and Fiona uh, Ingalls have uh, um, uh, articulated in relation to, to local authority action. I will uh, look at what Russell Finlay has asked me to do. I will consider what furthermore uh, we are able to do uh, and if there is any, uh, anything further we can do in relation to an independent re review and I will revert back to Russell Finlay directly. And Michael Mara. Thank you for saying no, sir. This week, teachers in Aberdeen told the BBC that they were scared to go to work because of rising violence in schools. A recent survey carried out by the EIS in Aberdeen found that nearly 40 per cent of teachers had been physically assaulted by a pupil. And these statistics should shock us all, and they demand action from a government that has taken its eye off the ball and allowed this problem to grow and grow. Scottish Labour is clear that we must take a zero tolerance approach to violence in our schools. Can I ask the First Minister exactly how much violence is he prepared to tolerate before he acts? First Minister. I think uh, most people will unfortunately see uh, that uh, this is an issue that Michael Mara is choosing to politicise and create uh, as a partisan uh, issue. His, as always, and his suggestion somehow that uh, having a slogan about zero tolerance will suddenly make the issue better, I'm afraid, is a complete failure of credibility on his part. Uh, what I would say is we are working with the teaching profession because they are very serious issues that have been raised uh, by teachers up and down the country. We take those issues extremely seriously. The Cabinet Secretary for Education has hosted a number of summits, again with educational professionals, with teachers uh, in particular, to see what more uh, we can do. And we've commissioned, as Michael Marrow probably know, uh, behaviour in school, Scottish schools research in order to establish the true picture, the evidential basis at a national level uh, of teachers and support staff's experience of behaviour in publicly funded mainstream uh, schools. Uh, well, the results of uh, the 2023 research highlighted that most children and young people are well behaved in class and schools. It also does tell us about that level of disruption uh, that does uh, exist. So it's clearly not good enough. And of course, we're working with our partners in local government to bring forward a joint national action plan to drive improvements. And I'm unsure that Michael Mara is kept up to date. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I seek your advice, Understanding Orders Chapter 9, following the publication today of the Stage 1 report of the National Care Service. The Chamber has agreed a few weeks ago that the Stage 1 debate should take place next Thursday. Members will know of my long-standing commitment to a National Care Service. Indeed, it is over a decade since I first proposed this, so what is currently happening troubles me immensely. I therefore seek your advice on two counts. Firstly, the conclusion of the report seems manifestly contrary to so much of the report's contents. Page after page of criticism appears to be ignored. It also appears that evidence given by the third sector and independent providers and those with lived experience is also ignored. Let's hear the member. The party whip has been imposed to get the bill over the line. Secondly, there is a question of the integrity of this parliament's processes. And let me explain. Substantial changes are being made to the bill following a deal between COSLA and the Scottish Government. No evidence has been taken on this as it came too late in the process. It radically changes the governance of a national care service and this is caused... I would be very grateful if we could hear the member. Thank you. This has caused... The reason I am asking is I cannot address a comment or contribution or a point of order if I cannot hear it. This has caused considerable disquiet in the care sector. Committee members of all political stripes have been trying to get the Scottish Government to bring forward their amendments so that they can be subject to scrutiny before Stage 2 starts. They have written to, they have spoken to the Minister, but the Government says no. One of the committee members even sought agreement to share the target operating model, which would have provided a direction of travel for the amendments. This too was refused. I am concerned that the Government does not yet have any amendments. Otherwise, why would they refuse to share them with the committee so that members can do their job and scrutinise them properly? There are unfortunate examples in this Parliament where the perception is that the committee did not do their job in scrutinising legislation. We should not let that happen again, as it is the integrity of this Parliament that is also at stake. So can you, presiding officer, advise if there is an opportunity for the committee to reconsider their report in light of the arguments I have made and what would be the appropriate vehicle to achieve this? Thank you.
Thank you. It's fair to say that I didn't pick up all of the members' comments, so I will refer to them and refer back if required. But I can confirm to the member that under the rule she refers to under 9.6.1, any member may by motion propose that the bill be referred back to the lead committee for a further report on general principles of the bill or on any particular part of the bill before the Parliament decides whether to agree to them. Um, a point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, presiding officer, I seek your guidance on the appropriate conduct of members of this Parliament. And And your powers to safeguard members of the public, our staff, visitors in general, to be able to enter and leave this parliament. As last night, members of the public seeking to enter this parliament were obstructed and intimidated. And all of this was orchestrated and trumpeted by a member of this parliament, a Scottish Green MSP. This is surely unacceptable conduct for a member of the Scottish Parliament to seek to prevent members of the public entering their own Parliament. So I ask for your guidance on the following. What actions will now be taken in the light of last night's events to secure safe access for the public to enter their Parliament at all times? Yep. And what action will be taken against the member who I believe has brought disrepute to the Scottish Parliament because not only did he plan and conduct the obstruction and the demonstration, but he claimed responsibility for it. He sought to shut down this Parliament. Now, we all believe in freedom of speech and the right to protest, but the right of the people of Scotland to come safely and securely into their Parliament and leave their Parliament when they choose to do so must also be safeguarded. Thank you. I am not aware of all the circumstances that the member, uh, that Mr Kerr refers to, but it's absolutely clear, I'm sure to all of us, that the security of all building users and our guests is absolutely paramount. And I can confirm that I'm aware that there were extremely difficult circumstances last evening. Um, and that all our scheduled events were able to proceed. And I'm certainly very grateful to our staff and to police colleagues who made that possible. I can assure all members that our procedures are very much kept under review and they are adjusted where that is appropriate. Point of order, Patrick Harvey. Further to that point of order, presiding officer, I trust and I hope we can all trust that in your consideration of these issues, you will give a high priority to the absolutely essential role that the right of peaceful protest plays in our democracy and in the life of our parliament. I have commented on the points raised. I am absolutely sure that all members here assembled understand the importance of the right of protest, but also of the importance that we place on the rights of all building users and staff to do so securely and safely. We will now suspend this item of business before we move on to members' business. And I'll allow a moment for the gallery and the chamber to clear.